So our final, final speaker for today's panel is Sean Giblin, the Mississippi River Water Quality Specialist with the Wisconsin DNR. Sean will be telling us about the many challenges the Mississippi River is currently experiencing related to climate change and actions we can take starting now to create a resilient Mississippi for future generations. And Sean will present for about 20 minutes and then we'll take questions at the end. Please remember to type your questions into the Q&A section and upvote questions you want answered. And Sean, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks a lot, Natalie. You see my slides all right, Natalie? Yeah, they look great. Okay. Yeah, sounds, yeah, first off, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you at Wisconsin Water Week. I think this is a really important venue too. And so, you know, really for my talk, I'm going to be talking about, you know, how climate change is impacting the, the health of the Mississippi River. So, you know, really as, as river biologists, we're accustomed to change, but, you know, really, you know, a lot of the changes we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years, you know, the rates of these changes are, you know, somewhat unsettling to many of us working on the river too. And, you know, many of us are starting to think about, you know, strategies we can use to adapt to these changing conditions. And yeah, I'll be sharing some examples of that today. You know, really one thing we have on the Mississippi River that we're pretty fortunate to have, you know, is a really, really nice long-term record of, of river discharge too. And, you know, sort of looking at this plot of, of mean annual discharge at Winona, Minnesota, just upstream of La Crosse too. You know, it's interesting to know, you know, between 1929 and, and 1980, you know, we really never had a year uh, with mean discharge greater than, than 45,000 CFS. And, and really in contrast to that, uh, you know, we've seen mean annual discharge greater than 45,000 CFS 11 times since 1980. And really six of those have occurred since 2011. So, you know, you know, really, it's not as if we'll never have a drought again, but, you know, really, again, sort of this prophecy of, of warmer and wetter, you know, really seems to be playing out on the Mississippi River. And so, you know, really, when we look at uh, mean annual precipitation in La Crosse, you know, this is a, a plot showing mean annual precipitation in La Crosse 1991 to 2019. You know, and it's interesting to note here that the red line on this plot is the average precipitation in La Crosse from 1961 to 1990. And so you can really see that, you know, very few of the years from 1991 through 2019, you have been below that roughly 30 inches of annual precipitation too. You know, and, and really, if you look at the last 10 years, you know, the average is, is more like 40 inches of precipitation in La Crosse too. So, you know, really as river biologists, when we look at this, you know, we can really see that, you know, kind of a 1990s mindset, you know, really isn't going to produce, you know, good re ecosystem results for the Mississippi River. You know, there, you know, there's a lot of problems related to, to higher river stage and, and higher discharge, but I think, you know, one of the most critical problems we see is, is the problem of island dissection or, or breaking through of, of a lot of the natural uh, levees or, or islands on the river too. And, you know, many times, you know, this can start as, you know, simply as a, a beaver run and then, you know, successive months of high uh, river stage and discharge can cause, you know, channels to basically break through into these quiescent backwaters, you know, you know, pumping a lot of sediment and a lot of excess water into these, into these backwater uh, ecosystems. You know, and one of the other problems we're seeing with, with high water is, is island of, uh, erosion of islands on the river too. You know, if you look at this photograph, you can see, you know, the various levels of high water on this river bank. You can see a tree, you know, ready to fall into the river too. So, you know, a lot of a lot of erosion, especially over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, you know, in mudslides, you know, this is something that I didn't really even think we could have in the driftless area until about the last 15 years, you know, and you can see by these pictures, you know, this is happening with increasing regularity, you know, and at times with really devastating consequences on the river. You know, and really one of the most obvious problems related to high river discharge and high river stage is loss of floodplain forest. So if you nowadays, if you boat around in, in the Mississippi River floodplain, you'll see these pockets of of dead or dying forest too. And so, you know, really these forest pockets, you know, they, they essentially just have their feet wet for too long, you know, and eventually succumb to that. It's kind of an obvious consequence of, of the high discharge we're seeing on the Mississippi River. You know, and, and even things like doing our job is becoming more difficult too. You know, it's, you know, many times in recent years, you know, you know, the majority of boat ramps will be underwater. So we find ourselves doing things like this, you know, literally 
you know, dumping canoes, you know, off the side of road beds and, you know, literally paddling down roads to get to our sampling sites. You know, th th this is a scene that we see more of in recent years too. You know, it's not only the magnitude of the water, you know, it's really when the water is coming, you know, so you'll see scenes like this with these midsummer floods uh, where you'll see, a, you know, emerging vegetation piled up on, on bridge pillars throughout the river, you know, just literally scouring out emerging vegetation during these, these midsummer floods. And so, you know, really, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, habitat degradation with this high water too, but I, th I think one of the, one of the habitat types that suffered the most is, you know, is these V-shaped islands out, out in the main thread of flow. Uh, you know, this is the Johnson Island complex in Pool 6 in Trempolo County, uh, you know, adjacent to Pro State Park, if you've been there too. And this is a complex that I've been looking at since 2015 and, you know, and seen a lot of change. So, so really, you know, since 2015, you know, we've seen an incredible increase in the volume of water moving into this backwater complex. You know, and really with that water, you know, we're seeing a, a, dr a dramatic increase in, in the amount of sedimentation, you know, the sediments basically coming with that water. We've seen a, you know, quite a loss of depth in the upper end of this backwater complex. And, you know, we've seen significant erosion to the upstream end of this island. And in addition to that, you know, a breach has broken through in the levee on the main channel side, you know, that's pumped a lot of sediment and, and excess water into this complex. So, you know, really, really a high level of change, you know, in a really relatively short period of time in these island complexes. You know, and really one of the other V-shaped islands that we'll be talking about today, we'll kind of use this as an example to really demonstrate some of the changes we're seeing on the river. This is the, the Probst Lake complex. Uh, up in Pool Five, uh, uh, near Elma, Wisconsin, too, and you know, so the the water comes into Probes Lakes through two different inlets: one on the upstream end uh, through Belvedere Slough, and then one with the lower arrow arrow down through the main channel. And we'll really just kind of work through this as sort of an example of some of the changes we've seen. And so, really, what this plot is showing is is river total river discharge by day of the year. You know, so this is the median discharge by day of the year. And so the plot on the left is showing you know, what the pattern was, you know, 1980 through 2010. And the plot on the right is showing this roughly uh, uh, the last 10 year period too. And so, you know, really when I was growing up on the river, you know, you know, about March 15th or so, you know, we'd get our walleye boat ready, we'd get our, our walleye rods ready, you know, because we really wanted to be ready, you know, for that early, early April flood pulse. And, and, and really after that, initial April flood pulse, you know, it was pretty predictable. We could really count on the river, river discharge declining, uh, you know, through the growing season, you know, and relative, you know, a little bit of a fall bump, but, you know, kind of, you know, settling in for the winter months too. And, you know, really this last, you know, 10 year period has, has been a pretty dramatic change in terms of what's been going on too. You know, we're, you know, we're starting to see, you know, you know, higher, higher flood pulses too. And, you know, the flood pulse is coming more more in sort of the May time frame, you know, and in really persistent high water, you know, through the majority of the summer months, you know, very high water, you know, well into July too, and you know, really almost any day of the year um, over this last 10 period, 10 year period, you'll, you'll see higher discharge in the Mississippi River. You know, and, and you know, us as river biologists, you know, we could really see this coming and we really wanted to arm ourselves with some information, you know, to be able to adapt to these changing conditions too. And, you know, what we've been doing is going into some of these these various backwater complexes, you know, engaging the amount of flow into these backwater complexes. Uh, so what this plot here is showing is basically the the, the amount of inflow into the Probes Lake complex uh, through both outlets as a function of total river discharge. Uh, you know, this is what we refer to as a rating curve. You know, and really once you have these rating curves established, you can begin to make estimates like this, you know, so this is an estimation of, of the total amount of flow uh, moving into the Probes Lake complex, you know, you know again, with the, at these two different time periods, you know, the 1980 to 2010 time period, uh, and this last roughly 10 year uh, time period too. So again, sort of just massive changes, you know, in both the timing and magnitude of water moving into to the Probes Lake complex, which is just sort of a typical uh, flow through backwater in the system at this point. You know, and, and really once you know, you know, the amount of inflow moving into one of these backwater complexes, you know, you can begin to, 
you know, to make you know, really good estimates of some of these key ecological variables too. And, you know, and one of these that we, we talk about a lot in the Mississippi River is water residence time. And so, you know, th this is the, um, the amount of time, you know, in the number of days, you know, that it takes to flush, you know, completely new water uh, through a, a backwater complex, in this case, Probst Lake. You know, and again, sort of looking at these two time periods too, you know, if you look at these last 10 years, you know, you know, this period, you know, day 100 to 200, you know, when a lot of the key uh, fish species in the Mississippi River are going into habitat like Probst Lake, you know, to spawn, you know, you know, we're seeing probes like, you know, flush, you know, multiple times a day, you know, just kind of a massive change, you know, you know, over what was the traditional regime, and, you know, and even later into the fall, you know, when a lot of the, a lot of the uh, backwater organisms move into, to habitat like probes lake to overwinter, you know, we're seeing really high flushing rates uh, through these backwater lakes at this point. You know, and so really, why do we care about this too? And I in terms of, you know, these backwater lakes, you know, being flushed too fast with, with channel water too. And, you know, really one of the classic examples of this is, uh, you know, backwater fish uh, in these backwater lakes uh, during the winter months too. And, you know, so, you know, really the water out in the main channel in the winter, you know, it's very, it's high in oxygen, but it's very cold, you know, near zero degrees Celsius, but with high oxygen too. And, I think one of the best descriptions that I've seen of this was by one of the USGS scientists, Jim Regala, too, where he kind of showed, you know, you know, this cartoon at the top, too, where, you know, if we don't move enough of that main channel water into these backwater complexes, you know, we end up with the condition, you know, with the fish on the left, the, you know, the I can't breathe fish, um, you know, and really, if we pump too much of that main channel water into these backwater complexes during the winter, you know, we end up with the condition on the right where the water is just simply too cold. You know, and really in between these two extremes is sort of, you know, kind of the just right or Goldilocks zone in the middle, where, you know, where conditions are favorable for both temp and oxygen. You know, and a lot of times it's sort of difficult for even, even river biologists to sort of wrap their head around this too, but you know, really the difference between, you know, success and failure in, in this key habitat type, you know, is literally one degree Celsius, you know, so the difference between zero degrees and one degree Celsius, you know, is literally the the difference between success and failure and, and really, you know, sort of with this really narrow band of ideal conditions between temperature, oxygen, and if you throw in backwater water depth too, you know, there's a very small proportion of the total, total river area that's suitable for overwintering, overwintering uh, fisheries habitat uh, in the winter months on the Mississippi River. And so, you know, to really kind of just show this played out with, with data we've collected on the Mississippi River, you know, this plot is, is showing uh, continuous dissolved oxygen and temperature uh, data from the Mississippi River uh, during the, one of these recent high flow winters too. So, you know, this was a period, you know, where the Probst Lake complex, you know, was flushing extremely fast, you know, res uh, water residence time, you know, less than two days when, when we know you know, to get that ideal mix of temperature and oxygen, we'd like to see a water residence time of around 12 days too. And, and so if you look at the data from these continuous sensors, you know, the dissolved oxygen in Probes Lake, plenty of oxygen, you know, between 12 and 13 milligrams per liter dissolved oxygen, you know, well above the five milligrams per liter, you know, oxygen we would like to see too. But again, you know, you know just too much water moving through. So the plot on the right, you know, the water's, you know, plenty of oxygen, but very cold, you know, well below the one degree Celsius that we would like to see. You know, so really, if we look at this, you know, this, this backwater lake, you know, is really functioning you know, almost more like a, like a side channel at this point when, you know, which really represents, you know, kind of a complete loss of, of ecosystem function for some of these backwater lakes on the Mississippi River. You know, and so really at the same time, you know, during this high flow area, you know, the tributary rivers, you know, are pumping a, a lot of sediment into the Mississippi River too. You know, we're really over time, you know, a lot of our backwater lakes on the Mississippi River, you know, are starting to look more and more, uh, you know, like the panel on the bottom here too, you know, we, we have a lot of these backwaters now, you know, where the water depth, you know, is around three to four feet deep, you know, plenty of oxygen, but, you know, but the water again is very cold top to bottom. You know, and what, what we're losing is, you know, really as sedimentation, it, you know, plays out on, in these backwater lakes, you know, we're, we're the deepest areas are filling in the fastest too. And we're losing backwaters, you know, like the top panel, you know, that have water, you know, kind of in what I call sort of the sweet spot, 
you know, six and a half to about 10 feet uh, of water to, you know, you know, where there's sort of a, a zone at depth, you know, where we tend to have this adequate mix of, you know, water that's both warm enough, but with uh, adequate oxygen to, you know, where the, you know, kind of a refuge, you know, where this cold, less dense water can ride over the top, but it, an area of refugia for these backwater organisms, you know, to really ride out these, these sort of changing and high flow winter conditions that we're seeing on the Mississippi River. You know, and so, you know, we've, we've done a lot of projects to really adapt to these changing conditions too. And, you know, you know, some involve sort of complex engineering, you know, that we've, we've talked about it with the UMRR program with some of the prior speakers today too. But I'm going to share with you an example of one that might be, you know, interesting for this group, because it's kind of an example of sort of grassroots sort of self-help uh, climate adaptation too. And, and, and this is uh an, an area called Black Deer Channel in the, in the north end of Lake Onalaska, just north of La Crosse. You know, and this is an area that you know, I've been getting complaints about in recent years you know, in terms of, you know, declining fisheries response to, and, you know, we've known that a breach, you know, has opened up in the, in the barrier island upstream of a key overwintering fisheries habitat um, section that we have in Black Deer Channel too. And, you know, so really my wife and I, you know, we paddled through this area you know, early in the spring, and you know, I was rather blown away by what I had seen. You know, this was you know just a trickle of water. You know, really not that long ago, too. You know, and to really see this, you know, in recent years, so that you know, so that gap has opened up, you know, to about thirty-five feet wide, too. And you know, we went into gauge flow into this backwater complex in August, and you know, engaged the the flow into this backwater complex. You know, at about thirty cubic feet per second. You know, which gives us a residence time of about 0.34 days. So again, you know, completely new water flushing into this backwater complex three times per day. And when we know sort of the optimal residence time, you know, for an overwintering uh, habitat complex is about 12 days, you know, so really just way too much flow, you know, under this climate change area, you know, and really a kind of a key piece of, of overwintering fishery habitat on the Mississippi River. You know, and so, you know, really kind of knowing that this had changed, you know, that dramatically, you know, we were very leery to leave it like this, too. And so we, you know, worked with our partners at the Fish and Wildlife Service and a local conservation club, uh, the Bryce Prairie Conservation Association, you know, and what they were doing was, uh, you know, they had a project to basically going out to, to cut and treat an invasive buckthorn in an adjacent area to Black Deer Channel. And again, we were sort of leery to sort of leave it like that through the winter months too. And so we devised, you know, this rather innovative plan to really adapt to this too. And so what we did is, you know, the volunteers, we went out and cut and treated that buckthorn. And then we bundled up that buckthorn, uh, you know, into brush bundles. And we essentially moved those brush bundles uh, via boat up to that gap that had opened up in Black Deer Channel. You know, crews up at the, at the notch, you know, basically use the stumps from the, from the invasive buckthorn to basically drive posts, you know, basically drive these bundles uh, into that gap to really close down that gap that had opened up, you know, during this last 10 years of high flow or so. You know, and really this is what it looks like. This is sort of the before and after of just kind of a grassroots, you know, climate adaptation. So that gap of about 35 feet, you know, was closed down to about a seven or eight foot gap. You know, so really, you know, the picture on the left here is basically what this what this opening looks like in the winter months now too. So you know, where we formerly had you know about thirty cubic feet per second of water uh, moving through this gap, you know, we're down to about four or five uh, CFS uh, moving through this gap too. And you know, really, local residents have you know been sending pictures to me, you know, throughout the winter, you know, some of the local catch through there. You know, we've been monitoring this for water quality, you know, throughout the throughout the winter to really look at sort of a pre post assessment of this area too. And you know, we're really encouraged with the, with the water quality response that we've seen. You know, I think we might, you know, adapt this a little bit based on the data we collected this year, but definitely moving, you know, in the right direction. And so again, you know, kind of the post project uh, flow in the Black River Channel, you know, about a sixth of what we saw pre project, you know, and we're seeing, we're seeing a pretty dramatic improvement in winter water quality for fisheries as a result, you know, just kind of a, a nice example of sort of a grassroots community driven uh, climate adaptation project in, in that's you know, producing a, a good result, you know, for the ecosystem and for people out recreating on the river. 
you know, so really just to wrap this up, you know, increasing discharge on the Mississippi River, you know, it's really resulting in pretty substantial changes uh, to river, Mississippi River water quality. You know, we're seeing, you know, really large changes in backwater residence time over the last 10 years. And it's really altering, you know, water quality and ecological dynamics, you know, for really a, a, a number of different mechanisms on the Mississippi River. You know, and really as a result of these changing conditions, you know, we developed some strategies you know, to really optimize the, the level of water exchanged. And you know, we've really been able to produce you know, really positive benefits. You know, I shared the Black, River, the Black Deer Channel example today too. Um, you know, and, you know, a number of different examples where we've, where we've done these adaptations to adapt to, to higher discharge on the river that I'd be happy to, to share with folks down the line too. And, you know, and really as we do these studies, you know, we're starting to really see and understand, you know, some of the key drivers, you know, things like backwater depth, uh, you know, various aspects of habitat project design, you know, they're really helping us to, you know, to really increase habitat diversity, you know, and really build some ecological resilience, you know, during these challenging conditions, you know, that we're experiencing currently, you know, and really some of the challenging conditions that, that we know are, are coming our way, you know, under sort of a climate change scenario that we're looking at. Um, so yeah, Natalie, yeah, that's all I have too. I don't know if we have time for questions. Yeah, we still have uh, about four minutes. So yep. um, one question that came in that I think you maybe have covered, um, but I'll ask it anyway, just in case you have anything you want to add is um, looking at water quality data of the Mississippi River, it appears that the ambient temperature of the river is slowly increasing. If yes, what type of impacts can this have on ecosystems and what can people do about it? Yeah, yeah, we are seeing an increase over time, um, you know, and one of the one of the effects that we're seeing too, you know, in addition to this work we're doing here, you know, we've been looking at uh, harmful algal blooms, you know, in some of the cyanotoxins that are produced by those cyanobacteria blooms in the river too. So, you know, really one obvious consequence of the warmer temperatures, you know, is the potential to have, you know, more intense blooms too. You know, and so, you know, you know, one way we can sort of deal with this too is to, you know, again, th through some of these conductivity projects too, where, you know, one area you know, that we're having a lot of problems with too is a base, an area that's sort of isolated from the river too. So, I mean, I think there are strategies to basically reconnect some of that isolated habitat to, you know, alter uh, temperature dynamics and, and get a better result, you know, especially for things like cyanobacteria. Great, thanks. Natalie, um, do you mind if I just add a couple more things? Absolutely, please. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight one, the importance of a UMRR program and those habitat restoration projects, because we are trying to fight those degrading influences. Um, second, um, what Sean was talking about with HABs recently, um, the Illinois, or excuse me, USGS picked the Illinois River Basin for its, uh, its next generation water observing system. And that specific focus is HABs and nutrients. So we just started kind of as a stakeholder talking to USGS of what that looks like, but some of that is just increased research and monitoring. So just kind of look out for that. The second thing is, is there is some interest um, with really to freshwater mussels and understanding what temperature can do. Um, I know that researchers out of the USGS um, Upper Midwest Environmental Science Center and La Crosse have actually put in some proposals for um, modeling um, freshwater mussel populations given um, different scenarios increasing temperature. So just know that there's some great work and we are trying to understand it because it is a, a challenge. Great, thank you. And um, this another question came in, and I think this might actually go back to Lauren's presentation. Um, it's, do you think our society has the will to reduce hypoxia by 45%? Yeah, I had to prepare for that one. Um, thank you for the question, though. Um, I would say, does everyone in our society? No, but there are plenty that do, and we have federal and state commitment to meet those goals, whether or not we actually meet those targets. Um, we have resources arguably not enough which is why i talked about the water quality improvement act and the importance of getting more federal state collaboration to the river basin and climate change is also making it a lot harder to meet those goals um, but i do want to also just highlight local watershed groups peer-to-peer -to -peer resource sharing and, and research such as human dimensions and social and behavioral resources so um not that all the other research researchers aren't important, but but those particular pieces can help us understand, say, barriers to implementing those conservation practices, especially if we're going to offer them, you know, most of those costs covered. 
you know, Natalie, one thing I would add to that too is like, you know, we have done a pretty good job, you know, in terms of reducing phosphorus loading too. And, you know, and I really, I'm really starting to see some movement in terms of, you know, kind of a willingness to reduce nitrogen too. So it's, I mean, I think on that front, I think there are some encouraging signs. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and okay, so we are at time. Um, I want to thank again our speakers, Sean, Steve, and Lauren for the presentations and everybody who joined us in the audience. Um, we'll be taking a short break until 9.45 a.m. Uh, please don't forget to visit the exhibitor and sponsor booths, participate in the Wisconsin Water Week challenges, vote in the photo contest, etc. all of which you can find in Event Moby. Um, and thanks, and we'll see you soon.